All right. All right. Hi. Um, so I'll just get started. So I'm uh, I'm Matt, and I've been working as a uh, tech writer for a couple of decades now, mostly in the field of enterprise software uh, and data analytics software. I've been a writer with Splunk for almost seven years now, which is a strange thing to say. It doesn't feel like I've been there that long, but Splunk's a fun place to work. And you'll find out one reason why I say that about halfway through this talk. Just for some context, I'll uh, let you know what Splunk is all about. So I'm gonna go all corporate on you for a moment. At its core, the Splunk platform enables you to collect data from anywhere with universal forwarding and indexing technology, search and analyze across all of your data with powerful search and schema on the fly technology, and rapidly deliver real-time insights from machine data to IT and business people through uh, powerful UI uh, and dashboards. And this is what we call operational intelligence. All right, now back to our scheduled program. I joined Splunk in 2008. Back then, our documentation set was relatively easy for us writers to manage and for our customers to apprehend. Back then, we had just one core product, and it was called Splunk. The documentation for that product was broken out into just a few manuals, um, all, all set out by role or task, and stuff was relatively easy to find. At that time, the bulk of our customers were technically sophisticated problem solvers. They were the kind of people who knew their way around regular expressions and who could tell you their TCP inputs from the UDP inputs. They loved the challenge of learning and mastering a sophisticated search language. And they're, they're just the sort of folks who now relax by hanging out on our IRC channel, hashtag Splunk and our answer site, helping newbies with their Splunk-related quandaries. And sometimes we hire them. Seven years later, things have changed. We now have customers who aren't as patient as those early adopters. They're not always as technically sophisticated or have the time or inclination to puzzle out solutions. They have complex problems that need to be solved yesterday. And our tutorials get them started, but they don't always take them where they need to go. Meanwhile, our documentation options have expanded as we've introduced more products and more manuals. There are more moving parts, more things to fit together, more docs to read. And there's a much wider range of functionality and problem solving capability if people know it's there and how to find it. And how to use it. At Splunk, we have a lot of communication with our customers. Every topic has a feedback form and an option to leave comments, and we try to respond to all of them. Customers also communicate with us through IRC and our answers community, and we also have a, a Twitter feed. And we get customer input from our support, sales, and professional services divisions. From day to day, most of our comments, most of the feedback that we get are suggestions for doc improvement. And occasionally we get praise, very occasionally. And also occasionally, very occasionally, people throw rotten tomatoes at us. A lot of the pointedly negative feedback relates to the plethora of manuals, the number of topic to topic links, and amount of reading that must be done. Others just want instructions, simple instructions for complex tasks. I want to do the thing. Show me how to do the thing. Please tell me this thing, it must be done. We can get people started with a tutorial, but it's obvious. We have a chasm that must be bridged. Something that will help us get users from beginner to intermediate, from intermediate to expert. Something that will connect the dots. For new users, getting started with a large enterprise application is like taking a journey into a dark, enchanted forest. There are quests that they want to take, but they do not see clearly how to complete them. So how do we get them started? 
How do we give them a way forward that puts them at ease and routes them around the obvious pitfalls? And how do we help them accomplish their objectives? You could give them a tutorial, something that helps them become entry-level dark forest explorers, a sort of hello forest exercise. They'll learn the basic prereqs, find out how to access the forest, and maybe do a quick camping trip overnight to get a feel for the place. It's good for a start, but it doesn't do much more than get people familiar with the basics. If they want to do something truly useful, like consult with the lady of the lake or successfully capture a firebird, they need more help. You could give your, provide your customers a conceptual overview of the dark forest, give the forest users some historical context and provide a general idea of the stuff they'll find in the forest. You could even include some cool diagrams to provide a big picture view of how the forest operates. Maybe it's powered by the magic of a unicorn or maintained and protected by a collective of sentient trees. Make sure to provide lots of links to the more detailed information, of course. Alternatively, you could provide procedural information, lots and lots of task-oriented topics that cover all of the different kinds of things that an experienced dark forest explorer should know how to do. A different procedure for every possible thing one might want to do in the forest. If you provide a decent table of contents and index, they should be able to piece together the various uh, tasks they need to carry out, whatever quest they want, right? But these solutions aren't always super helpful for users who need to make the leap from spending a night near the border of the forest to doing something that is actually significant. The conceptual overview is too broad, the procedures are too detailed, and many of them are irrelevant to what some forest explorers need to do. This is where a scenario or a use case based walkthrough can come in handy. So let's say you have a customer named Scarlett, a little hard to see there. She's got a delivery to make. She wouldn't ordinarily have to do this, but her younger cousin went in without much prep and is now missing. Scarlett needs help getting to a small senior citizens community that is mysteriously located in one of the more treacherous parts of the wood. Can you help her out? Sure you can. So here's where you come up with a way to tell an instructional story that brings the customer to the ending they want. Not the one where they find themselves in the belly of a wolf wearing an old lady dress, but one where they are victorious. It's similar to the tutorial, but it goes further. It knows who it is talking to and what they want to do. It provides useful prereqs that are specific to the task at hand. It assumes that certain basic knowledge, such as how to find and enter the forest, is known and it provides useful tips and tricks to get them through their journey with a minimum of distress. Most importantly, it takes into account some of the more threatening variables that might trip up the customer. And it tells the customer how to minimize or defuse their menace. The point is to show your customer how to get a complex task done in a way that might help them take on similar tasks in the future with a minimum of confusion. I'm not sure if people can see the red text. If you see a large talking wolf, ax it a question. And ax it again. Several different points there where a wolf might come up and axing it is the solution. Now all this talk about ax combat with werewolves in weird enchanted forests full of fairy tale creatures is reminding me of something that's kind of relevant to our topic. There it is. Tabletop role-playing games. Dungeons and Dragons. Now, I'm willing to bet that the majority of people attending this talk either know what I'm talking about from direct experience or know people who do. A number of you are either self-identifying nerds or are nerd-adjacent. <laughs> That's how Ann Wheaton, wife of Will, describes herself. 
Storytelling and getting people through it to the end is at the heart of D&D. For those who are unfamiliar with the dynamics of D&D, it boils down to this. You have a set of players and a game master. The game master tells the players what they see. The players tell the GM what they do. And the GM tells them what happens. Dice are rolled to determine the outcome of certain actions and events. If the game master is doing their job and the players are sufficiently focused, everyone gets swept up in the adventure. Sometimes legendary, sometimes ludicrous, always fun. Neither party knows exactly what will happen next until it's all over. Along the way, ridiculous things are said and hopefully people remember to write them down. This is a great tumbler if you haven't seen it. So I came back to D&D a few years ago after a hiatus of several decades. I played the game through much of middle school and high school. This was back in the early 80s when the only types of D&D available were called basic and advanced. It was still a pretty new thing. Then I went to college where I made friends who were more interested in deconstructing French New Wave cinema and debating postmodern theory than playing role-playing games. And it became a thing of the past. Two decades and change later, I joined Splunk. Rachel, my boss at the time, played D&D and was thinking about getting an office game going. When she asked me if I'd like to join, I said, sure. That was around 2009, and our little group is still going. Turns out, D&D goes well with Scotch whiskey. <laughs> Who knew? So here's the gang I play with at Splunk. By day, they're the best of our product development, support, business development, professional services, and sustaining engineering teams. Every other Wednesday night, however, they become someone else. We order delivery food, and sometimes someone brings some nice wine, and we stay late at the office rolling dice, chasing slave merchants through ancient subterranean minotaur cities, and slaying terrible beasties. And it's a good time. So the interesting thing about D&D, as well as just about all other decent role-playing games on the market, is that it is heavily documented. There are a lot of rules and tables and charts and stats and types and classes of things. All the stuff you need to build and operate a fictional world that works with playable mechanics. Some people are frightened away by all this text. But as a kid, I was drawn to it. This is the book that sold me on the game way back in 1982. A whole manual of monsters. What could be greater? I spent hours poring over all the monster descriptions and stats. Some of them I memorized. Carrion crawlers, owl bears, intellect devourers, chromatic dragons, and the dreaded beholder. So there you have it. I was fetishizing a manual, documentation, when I was in middle school. Suddenly, my choice of career path makes sense. <laughs> so, just like software, new versions of D&D are released every few years. With every version, they put out a new set of manuals with updated rules, adjustments to gameplay, and new art. The fifth edition of Dungeons & Dragons was released last year to mostly positive reviews. Here's what the monster manual looks like now. A little hard to see, but... Uh, the art and book design is a lot cleaner nowadays, for better or worse, depending on your preference. Personally, I love that updated beholder on the cover, but I know several people who always prefer the relatively crude sketches of yesteryear. In software documentation terms, I see the player's handbook as the user manual. This is where people go to get the ground rules for the game's operating system. It's where they learn how to create their characters. It teaches players how to handle basic adventuring things, buying supplies, combat with weapons, learning skills, acquiring and casting spells, and so on. It gets both players and game masters started. The Dungeon Master's Guide is for game masters only. It's an administrator's manual. It tells game masters how to run a game that moves well and is fun for the players. And it also functions as an SDK. 
There's a great deal of material to aid game masters and adventure developers in the creation of imaginary worlds and the adventures that take place in them. And the, the adventures, or modules in D&D parlance, are where everything comes together, because without the adventures, there's no game. They're the story that the game master tells, the environment that the players the environment that the players move within and make their decisions within. The adventure is all scenario-based documentation. The only difference here is that this documentation is transmitted to the end user through the map, through the, sorry, transmitted through the, uh, to the end users through the admin who keeps the details a secret, and the game master has the map. The players need to discover it and defeat the creatures, traps, and plot developments between them and their goal. But at the end of the day, the mission of a D&D adventure shares many of the same goals as scenario-based documentation. They want to get the end users from the start of an adventure story to its satisfying conclusion. They help the end users accomplish a few amazing feats along the way. And ideally, the process of engaging in and completing the adventure ensures that the users level up at the end so that they complete the experience stronger and with more confidence than they had when they went in. So, just to make sure this doesn't sound too much like a clever buzz marketing campaign for Wizards of the Coast, the company that publishes D&D, let's talk about what happens when things go wrong with their products. D&D pretty much lives and dies by how playable it is. Over the years, when the, the, the rule set has gone under, undergone several major revisions, when I came back to the game a few, uh, few years back, they were on the fourth edition, which was a considerably more complicated than the version I'd played as a teen. The fifth edition of D&D scaled back the rules to make the game more approachable for new users and to make gameplay more, move faster. Overall, it looks like the fifth edition is well received, but that doesn't mean Wizards of the Coast isn't making missteps. Their first big adventure for the new edition was panned by critics. The culprit? Bad writing. Obvious and unimaginative adventure workflow, maps that weren't correctly labeled, and a whole bunch of material that somehow failed to get into the printed book. So they offered it as a downloadable PDF instead. A lot of things that could have been corrected by a more detail-oriented team of writers who were given perhaps a little more, who were perhaps given a little more time than they, a little less time than they ha uh, needed to deliver their product. Does that sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> In tabletop role-playing games like D&D, there's a concept called railroading. Part of the fun of these games is that the players theoretically have absolute free will. For example, there's technically usually nothing really stopping a group of players from quitting a dungeon crawl, going topside, setting up a crepe shop in a nearby village, if that's what they really want to do. This is where a game master sets up all kinds of devices to push players through an adventure, all to keep them on the one true path. They can create maps that appear to allow players to go in a variety of directions, but in reality only provide one way to get from point A to point B. Oh, you want to go to the next town instead of the Griffin Keep? Go ahead! Oh, too bad, the bridge of that town was washed out by a storm. <laughs> or they might have a whole host of non-player characters, village innkeepers, town mayors, stray knights, constantly remind the players that they need to continue the obvious mission when they seem to be stalled out somewhere, or worse, going in the wrong direction. Railroading is controversial. When it's really obvious, it can make for a dull game. Nobody enjoys feeling like a puppet. On the other hand, plotless stories are lame as well, so the trick is to come up with stories that are worth going on a railroad for. This is also true for scenario documentation, especially if you're documenting a product that is wide open in the range of choices it gives its users. If your product has a UI component and the UX team is good, they may be able to mitigate a certain amount of customer confusion that comes with huge feature sets, endless configurability, and somewhat free-form task work workflows. But either way, you'll still want to document some of the well-defined use cases for your customers to help them down the road. 
Get to know your customers well enough to find out where they want to go and, and what they want need to do. Then take them there in an express train, train to Awesome Town, otherwise known as that perfect solution to their truly vexing problem. Unlike D&D &D players, your customers aren't expecting surprises and would rather not run into them. They don't mind the railroad experience, especially if they learn something new along the way. So as we come back to our side of the looking glass and return to the subject of documenting technology products, I'd just like to reiterate that scenario-based documentation is for customers who have finished the tutorial and now want to get something real done. The tutorial got, did its job. It got them to a hello world state with their product. Now you need to give them some scenario-based documentation to get them to where they really want to go, the off-world colonies. They want a Hello Mars, Hello Neptune, or even a Hello Urit cloud experience. And you can give it to them. The Splunk documentation organization was aware that there was a need for some kind of large-scale scenario-based material. While we spent our time just trying to keep up with the pace of development, documenting new functionality and birthing new manuals to contain that documentation. We had people in our professional services and sales engineering teams taking our documentation debt into their own hands, designing and writing case-oriented educational material to bridge the gap between novice user and expert. In October of last year, my coworker Robin Pile and I had our attention drawn to a presentation for Splunk Enterprise, our core product. It was created by the sales engineering organization at our Hong Kong office. It led customers through the process of creating a dashboard that displayed data about pass password hacking attempts on a web server. It covered a variety of subjects, extraction of fields from log data, construction of the necessary search strings, creation of a dashboard with different types of data visualizations, and hacking into the XML behind the dashboard to add specific drill down mechanics. This project brings together functionality that is currently spread across six or seven manuals. If a user tried to figure out how to put this project together on their own, they would have to read through large portions of those manuals and do a lot of trial and error to get it right. Some people are up to that challenge, but a lot of people aren't. In other words, it was just the thing we were looking for. The Splunk Development Organization was gearing up for a big Hack Week event, and we decided to make this our contribution. We were the first doc team in the history of Splunk to participate in a Hack Week event, and it was a lot of fun. For the Hack Week draft, we threw the project together in Google Sites, partly to get the feel of a different doc solution than the one we typically used, and partly because it could do a few things that our current doc solution can't, at least at the moment, like display video. The target audience for this is the sort of user I've been talking about all along. Someone who has basic familiarity with the product and who is now trying to get over that hump from beginner to intermediate or from intermediate to expert. I like being able to put note information in the sidebars along the right side of the page. When we were finished, the, product, the project was a hit. We received praise not only from our managers but also upper management in development and marketing. Next, we moved our scenario-based doc project to PonyDocs, our homebrewed, open-source, media wiki-based documentation system. It now looks cleaner and like part of our doc set. The right-hand sidebar notes had to be added to the main text of the body in the scenario of the scenario stages, but we hope to get them back in a future update of the PonyDocs UI. The scenario starts by clarifying the use case at hand and listing the goals of the project, the things that the user needs to complete to resolve the use case. The goal section also includes a big picture summary of the stages involved in getting to those goals and a list of the prereqs that must be completed before they can start. In this case, the main prereq is the indexing of the sample data that this scenario depends upon. We created a video that quickly demonstrates the end goal, which in this case is the dashboard that the users are to build. The video does not waste any time explaining how the dashboard gets built. We broke down each stage of the project into easily digestible groups of procedures, breaking down some of the cognitive leaps a user needs to make in order to solve this problem. 
And yes, this is an obvious railroad, but we are confident that it is a track the user won't mind following. This particular stage of our scenario, titled Examine Your Data, contains two procedures. One where the user reviews event patterns in the data and finds a pattern that fits the type of events they want to search on, and another where the user runs a search using the event pattern they have isolated. When they're done, they'll go to the next stage of the scenario, where they learn how to extract fields from the events returned by that search, fields that they'll need for their dashboard visualizations. Other writers at Splunk are beginning to have their own approaches to scenario-based documentation. Writers for our apps team deal with product offerings that do not always involve the broad range of functionality covered by the core product, but they're still trying to help our users with use cases that aren't easily sorted out by just reading the manual. This use case scenario shows the user how to build a solution for an online marketplace that needs to maintain its service level agreements. The marketplace is guaranteed that their site will be available 99.9% .9 of the time, which translates into a maximum allowable downtime of 43.2 minutes per month. This document shows the user how to create a service that monitors the site for problems that could lead to a service failure, sends alerts when failure conditions occur, and identifies root cause so problems can be solved quickly. So what have we at Splunk learned while working on these projects? First off, know your customers. Know what problems they're trying to solve. Find out what roadblocks they're running into as they stumble around trying to solve these problems on their own. If you don't know, talk to people at your organization who have regular customer contact. Support sales, professional services, education services. Develop customer profiles and pitch the scenario to a specific profile. This can cut down the scope of the scenario and its solution. Remember that this isn't exactly a tutorial. It's not about getting started. It's about what to do after you've gotten started. It's about solving big problems. And this isn't a marketing case study. Marketing folks sometimes pr promise your customers the moon. If that's what they're doing, then this is where you show them exactly how they do get to the moon. Prove your product can do what marketing says it does. Try to keep it as simple as possible. This is why chunking information into separate, easily digestible topics can be a good idea. The longer the topic, the more overwhelmed the customer is likely to feel. Don't waste time explaining how things work under the hood if you don't need to. Provide informational links out to the primary doc set for that sort of thing. If you can use video, use it sparingly, strategically, and as a supplement to the text. Video should always be used for illustration rather than documentation. And keep your videos short. We kept ours down to 30 seconds on average. Customers should not need to watch video to know how to do a thing. And finally, building these things can be fun. They allow you to see the product through a specific customer's eyes. In the process, you sometimes discover new ways to write about your subject that you hadn't before. You're telling a cool adventure story, and it gives, you, gives the customer a Hollywood ending every time. And what's better than that? And that's it for me. So. <laughs> All right.